Imagine the following dilemma. You're in China and you happen upon a small antique shop and inside there are many curiosities, but in an old dusty box in the corner, you find a stone object that you can consider to be incredibly beautiful. And it has a texture that looks like it's incredibly hard to achieve in this stone material. Now, just for imagination's sake, let's imagine that this is what you found. I can show you this closely here in the light. Let's imagine that you find this stone object and the surface is, seems somehow um, in the first function, amazing and beautiful. Yeah. Now, it's got this incredible deep green luster its first function elements, because you know about the first function, you find to be quite amazing. And you talk to the shop owner, yeah? And you try to decipher and communicate with one another because you don't have the same language. And the shop owner speaks a little bit of English and thinks it's a little odd that you like the object, but decides that, sure, I'll sell this to you and you negotiate a fair price for it. Let's say you take the object home and then you do some research. Yeah, you, you look into various art books, you look to see who made this sculpture, who made this and created this work, this artifact. Yeah, and then you suddenly discover that this is not made by a human, that actually it's created during a volcanic eruption when two rocks are melted together um, under extraordinary force. All right, now that's my story. That's not this object. This object was, was created um, by nature differently, yeah. But let's just imagine a volcano, extreme heat creating this object, okay? Extraordinary force. Here's the philosophical question. Is this a work of art? Now, fascinating about this, it depends. I can tell you what the traditional definition is. And this brings up something, a fascinating divide, and it's gonna bring up how conservative are we in our ideas of art and how liberal are we in our ideals of art. And you, we're gonna encounter that um, during this lecture, yeah. Now the traditional approach, because traditions matter, you know, and all of you are going into um, fields that have strong traditions. So we have to understand what a tradition is, even if we wanna change it, because often the traditions last and they're there for purposes. So, with this work of art here, John Dewey, who wrote Art as Experience, would say, no, this is not a work of art. Because once we found out it wasn't made by a human, it's no longer art. It's now a work of nature rather than a work of art. It's now a natural curiosity of the world. It can still, in his mind, have extreme beauty to it, but it suddenly no longer belongs in one museum, a museum of art. It now belongs in another museum, which brings us to a kind of fascinating question. I always like to ask this when I teach a class because, you know, I, most of you know New York is my favorite city. Yeah, I also like Paris a lot too, but uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm gonna pick an American city, uh, I'm a New Yorker, yeah. And the thing about New York, if we went up to about, oh, 81st, 82nd Street, next to the park on the east side, and I asked you, what is there? Yeah, some of you might say, oh, that's the Metropolitan Museum of Art one of the largest museums in the world, with one of the largest collections of art. Yeah, fantastic works. You have to visit it when you go to New York, yeah. Now, I'll ask you this. What's on the other side of the park, on the west side of the park? 
just about at the same level. And some of you would say, oh, that's the Museum of Natural History. That is where often we find dinosaur bones and we find works of nature, things that we want to study and preserve that are of the natural world. Those are the traditions that we grew up in. Yeah. Now, let me show you another work of art. Another green piece of art. Yeah. Now, again, this is stone. First function. This is stone. Yeah. I can ask, what is this stone? And someone in here might say, if you love rocks, and you, one of the things that gives it away, yeah, sometimes you can see this iridescence. This is Labradorite, yeah. It is a stone that creates these kinds of rainbows of fluorescence as it, you know, reflects light, yeah, beautifully. This is a piece of jade, yeah. Now, this work belongs in the museum. This is a work that we might find in the Natural History Museum. Now again, what's fascinating to me is this can look like a sculpture. It can look like a very minimalist, modern sculpture. But this work is suddenly different. Now, if I asked you how old it is, someone might be precocious and say, well, it's, they're rocks. So these rocks are millions of years old. And I would say, yes, this work of art was carved probably somewhere between 1300 and 1600. If you looked at it as a jade piece, someone might say that's from China. Someone might also say this work is Ming. It's from the Ming Dynasty of China. So kind of beautiful, one of the iconic dynasties with iconic works of art. Yeah, this kind of dragon here with this lovely little bird on its back. Yeah. Now, fascinating to me though, is there's quite a difference between these two things. And there's so much of a difference that the fact that this was made by a human of the style of that dynasty, in that dynasty, places this in one museum, and the fact that this is a work of nature places it in traditionally another museum. Now, I'm going to show you some examples where now there are some museums that are challenging those ideas, that are moving us into other ways of thinking about art. and. We are living right now in a world where we are thinking about social justice and we are thinking about how do people belong and how do we treat each other and have we even created systemic um, avenues that have disenfranchised some people. Yeah. These, are, these are important questions for us to grapple with right now. Now, what's interesting to me is I'm sitting here, some of these pieces are made in South America and in Mexico. Now, some of these pieces were considered to be um, works of art by underdeveloped nations and, and, and people that were of the same caliber as some of the Western ideas you know, that we were thinking about, that we put in a, in a type of museum. So there are actually some of these types of pieces were also put in um, museums of natural history. Same thing with works of pre-Columbian art, works of African art, works of art from Oceania, that all of these kinds of pieces, we're now rethinking some of that for really good reason. And sometimes it's a little difficult for museums to grapple with their collections of where a work of art should be, yeah, because they don't want to get rid of their collections or should we get rid of the Natural History Museum or should it only be the works that are really created by nature because this obviously was created 
by a human. Yeah. Um, one other thought with this piece here is that a human did have something to do with this work. You can, you can say that the human polished this piece, the human maybe, you know, had to do with the shape, making it so that it could sit. So that kind of brings us to that idea of how much does a human have to do? But one of the things I just encourage you to think about with, with works of art is what, where have they traditionally been and how should we deal with them? Yeah, and should this go to the museum, the Metropolitan Museum, or should it be in the Natural History Museum? And that's, right now, it's still in the Natural History Museum. The his, that Natural History Museum has dinosaur bones. It also has things like the Hope Diamond. It's got gems. It's got really beautiful, amazing things that have been created from our natural world. But there are those other works that are um, of humans. Uh, so an artifact for Dewey was a work that um, was created by a human being and was created as part of a creative process. And one of the things we think is that someone intended to do something when they made it. It didn't just happen that there was incredible thought to making this piece. There was a desire, and as some of you even said, a desire to express something that forced this artist to come up with an idea, a process, and a way of transforming the materials yeah. and creating something that somehow has feeling to it and communicates to us. This is a classic example from many aesthetics books, the Driftwood Artifact. So here's another suppose. Suppose you're walking along the beach and you pick up a piece of driftwood. You take it home and you can do several things with it. One, you carve it, you sand it, you paint it peacock blue, and you hang it on the wall. Number two, you drill two holes in it and you stick candles in it. Number three, you use it as a doorstop. Number four, you take it to science class, you experiment on it, and you show what chemically happens to the wood after it lies on the beach for a long time. And number five, you toss it in a closet and you forget about it. Which of these is the work of art? Now, fascinating, most people would say maybe one, maybe number two also, because they're interested in how much did someone change the original materials? How hard did they work and what did they do to it? Now, one and two, are even designed in a specific way because some people might say when you painted it blue and you hung it on the wall you made it into something else you transformed it in a way you changed it and that might be more different than if you just put two holes in it so that it could be a utilitarian piece and it could just hold your candlesticks yeah so those are interesting and we're going to circle back to that idea of art and craft which has been a great divide in the world of art. An artifact, specifically, is defined by anthropologists as any object that's manufactured or used by humans. So what you can see is that every work of art, then, is an artifact, but not every artifact is a work of art. We could have something that is a tool this was manufactured and made, and I, I use this um, for a specific reason. But more often than not, when these are on my face, people aren't thinking, oh, wow, he's, he's wearing art today uh, to that. Now, sometimes fashion is a little different, that there are some, some fashion things that we will elevate because of designers, and we will call them artful 
in that way uh, that you know and and that's a well it's an interesting thing is if you can consider it is an Hermes bag a work of art yeah you might honor it in that way but it's again that question of does it belong in a museum now interestingly enough now it does the Met Museum in New York has created a costume collection and a fashion collection so the, now they have elevated the, that design and these objects that can be preserved in a way in a museum next to some of the traditional pieces we have thought of, the Van Goghs and this Ming piece. Yeah. So that's a fascination and a, a way that you're seeing that the institutions are being pushed and changed. Yeah. Now, in a dance, steps are the materials that we use, the movements and the steps. And a, a dancer transforms them. And most of us know that we don't just, like beads, string different movements together. We come up with ways to give them signatures in feeling and in the efforts and the pathways and the momentums that every all of the first we manipulate the materials and the first function elements to create unique transformed steps in a dance that come together yeah including the feeling in a piece you know that is a part of the first function it's weight, the feeling of the piece that it's weight it's speed, but also the feeling. Is so, We all know that some movements are more happy and joyous, and some movements are more somber and sad. Yeah, so those are things that we, we find in a work. Yeah. Um, each, I often, just thinking about this for a moment, I think that a movement is like a container, you know, that it can contain feeling. And when it's really good, it's almost like a sponge that is just brimming with water, that the water is just, the fluid is dripping off of it because it is so rich and full, yeah. It's an orchestra. A painting is that too. It's an orchestra of forms, and each of those forms contain feeling to it. Here's another piece that sits on one of the shelves behind me, yeah. If you look at this, again, it is rock. It, this is another stone. But if you look closely, it might reveal that in its past, it had a different um, form to it. It was not stone. This is a piece of petrified wood. Yeah. Now, again, somebody has smoothed it. You can see this knot hole here, but all in stone. Yeah, I sometimes call this piece the nose because it almost looks like a face. Now I'm showing you this because sometimes a work, a rock can look like it's a work of art. Yeah, this re can resemble a stone sculpture probably a modernist stone sculpture. We'll look at one in this lecture, yeah, in this chapter. But Dewey would say, externally, the rock and the sculpture could look alike, but the difference is whether a person is responsible for the shape, the color, the size, and the other features of it. Yeah. And again, it brings us back to that question. How much does someone have to do? Is polishing this enough, you know, and displaying it to make it a work of art? Or just honoring it in a way and saying, I think it's a work of art. I'm an artist. I say it's art. It's art. That's a fascinating question, and we've encountered that. But again, it brings us to that idea of natural objects, works of nature, and works of art. Yeah. Another simple little movement analogy sometimes for dancers, since we have so many movers that are in this class, is that we can look out the window and look at people walking down the street. And sometimes that looks like choreography, the way people flow 
And especially if you're listening to music and you're watching everyone move, sometimes it, the world looks like a dance, you know? But the question is, can the natural world, just people moving, is that really a dance? Or does that need someone who's made choices and transformed those steps? Can a dance be haphazardly happen? Can it just, can art just haphazardly happen? Another fascinating question to think about, or does someone have to have chosen those things? It brings us to that question of improvisation. Is improvisation the same as a choreographed piece of choreography? Interesting thing. I'm not giving you an answer because any answer I give would just be my biased opinion of it. Yeah. But most dances we think of as someone choosing and painstakingly finding each of those movements that go from one step to the other. Yeah, interesting.